Courtney and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going over my January recap. So it's the first Monday of February so it's not that late but I know February is already a pretty short month. So in that regard yeah we're like basically almost done February. What the heck? I had a good a pretty decent January reading month but not as productive in terms of like my own physical books as you'll see when I go through the the books that I reviewed. I think I reviewed almost all of them up on my blog in some shape or form. That was a goal of mine so in that way it was a success since I was posting a lot more. I was reflecting a lot more. I used my reading life journal from Ann Bogle, Modern Mrs. Darcy a lot to track a lot of my reading and to write my reviews before I transferred them over to the digital copy on WordPress and my website of incessantbookworm.com. So I think that was very helpful since I in a way was forced every time I finished a book to write my thoughts down either that day or the next day as much as I remembered about the book and initial feelings and thoughts and that helped me kind of craft the the review on my blog better so that I feel like I'm reading more I'm getting more quality out of my reading more so than quantity so I think that's still a plus even though it wasn't as many physical books that I was hoping for so I guess it's it's still a win <laughs> in that regard and I will go with that so I use this to kind of track my reviews or like my thoughts and then I used my own personal like journal. I think this is the Pride and Prejudice Chiltern edition blank journal that I had started writing in in December to kind of like plan out how I wanted to do my reading journal or like log all my reading for the year and this kind of proved nice for simplicity's sake and then planning out my content as well. So in that sense I will go through a few of my stats. So I read 10 books. There were five audiobooks, one ebook, and four print books. So like I said a little bit higher on like the digital formats than I was hoping but still a lot of quality reading there. The different genres that I read were young adult, contemporary, mystery thriller, nonfiction, and historical fiction. So pretty pretty good range there. A lot more nonfiction than I was expecting. But this month was all about the January Bookopoly, which was like that little board that looks like a Monopoly board. And it has different clues or different prompts on there that are like bookish related. It was created by Becca at Becca's Bookopoly. And I will link that below. Like you can do it at any time. I think she had done it, I think October? or September sometime in like the fall of last year I want to say was like one that she was like advertising for other people to join into but you can do it at any time it's not based off of specific month or season or theme or holiday or anything so that's what I wanted to start the year off with and I had let's see a few of them that actually were from the bookopoly I didn't finish or I didn't beat bookopoly I got let's see okay so only four four out of the seven were completed I like I thought there's a lot of books with like shop or book in it and I counted those twice instead of just once so there we go. And then yeah in terms of total pages read I read 2,351 pages so it's a good starting point. Not sure what the rest of the year will, will yield in that. My friends were saying like oh 10 books that wasn't like what you were thinking because I wanted to read more than that. And they're like, well, you didn't you set your TBR last year to 100? And if you do 10 books a month, there's 12 months, there'll be 120, you'll be fine. But for some reason, it just didn't, doesn't pan out in my head that way. It just doesn't seem like it'll get to 120, even though I'm setting it as 100. I don't know if this makes sense. But not that I was disappointed. I just thought I was going to read more because January was like a longer month. But a lot more things had come up. I got COVID. I had a really busy last few weeks at work and that's trickling into February as well. It's finally knock on wood slowed down tomorrow which is Monday February 7th. Might be a little bit busy until the 10th which is another one of my deadlines for work. So fingers crossed that I can survive <laughs> and then hopefully have um, some time to rest. I do have presence day off so I'll have a three-day weekend for that so anyway those are kind of the stats and like the rundown of what this month was all about so now let's get into the book first book I finished was clap when you land by Elizabeth Acevedo and this was an audiobook in prose and like poetry style writing and it was amazing it's about these two young women who are sisters or half sisters but they don't know it and they find out that they are related because their dad passed away during a plane crash 
along with other folks that were on the plane and they find out about each other, message each other back and forth and are kind of like curious about what the other one is like and kind of mad and angry at them for like stealing their father away at different points or like not letting them see the real them or like all of them all of the time. So we learn about the two of them in their different environments. So Camino and Yahara. Camino is from Dominican Republic and Yahara is in New York City. So they are like d their own people, their own like personalities and everything, their own struggles with kind of having their dad present half of the time without them really knowing why or like they were assuming it was like work related or whatever and then when he passes away they kind of connect. Yahara visits Camino in Dominican Republic and like ends up they both end up finding out what sisterhood really means and that I thought was really nice that they they had all these challenges of like the other woman the other daughter the other family but they kind of put that aside and started to trust one another because they were both experiencing this at the same time without really knowing. So that I thought was phenomenal. I gave it a five out of five stars. Definitely recommend that on audiobook if you can, since it's just so lyrical. Elizabeth Acevedo reads one of the parts herself, which I thought was pretty cool. And it just is uh, just amazing to hear it that way and told in that like beautiful spoken word kind of narrative. Then I read The Bookshop of Second Chances by Jackie Fraser. I keep wanting to say Fraser, like uh, Scotland. I don't even know if she is Scottish. I have no idea. So this follows the story of Thea and she is getting a divorce and is like trying to find herself again or just like escape that heartbreak. So her husband was cheating on her and is finding out that he is going to have a baby with this other person when that was a struggle for him and Thea. So she's all kinds of emotions, all kinds of frustrations and challenges. And then she goes to her, I think it's either her uncle or her grandfather's or great, or what is it if it's a grandfather's brother, like great uncle, I think that's what it is, great uncle's cottage that who he just passed away and left like the will and like this collection of books with her. And she's going up there to clean it out and kind of like figure out if she wants to sell it and find out really what's next. And she runs or she meets up with like the bookseller in town who is interested in purchasing some of those books to sell himself. And they kind of develop a friendship relationship. He has like a kind of interesting story with his family in that town since he's kind of royalty or kind of in line for some kind of um, like official title, but he passed it to give it to his brother because it's not wasn't something that he was interested in and him and his brother have not gotten along. So a lot of different dynamics going on there with him and his brother, Thea and her ex, soon to be ex-husband, and then them kind of combining to make a, a duo in terms of running this bookshop together because she doesn't want to go home quite yet and she's enjoying her time in the town. So this I thought was okay. I, I, I was interested at first about it being about like a bookshop, but I felt like it was missing something. Like I'm never a big fan of like infidelity and cheating and that was going on in like multiple ways. Like the brother, or like the owner of the bookshop was involved with a lot of infidelity and then Thea's husband was and like that stuff like pisses me off honestly when that's a part of the story. And then I didn't like how it all got wrapped up or how the owner of the bookshop kind of like has an aha. It just it just felt so rushed and unrealistic to me. So that that kind of nicked it down a few in terms of my stars. I think I gave it a three, three and a half out of five. Still enjoyable, but I feel like because they were including a lot of adult topics and themes, I feel like they could have explored those more instead of like rushed through this like, okay, we're good and like I'm in love now kind of mentality. So I don't I don't know. I'm not the writer. I don't know what the, the thought was behind that, but still not bad. <laughs> That's, what kind of review is that? What kind of um, recommendation is that? I think I put it as, let's see, I recommend it to anybody who likes books about folks. I think you'll still enjoy it. But yeah, just know that going in that the kind of wraps up a little too like perfectly in a bow. Then I read Later by Stephen King. So this, I forgot to mention, Clack When You Land was one of the books recommended to me for the 12 books, 12 friends reading challenge for the year. So that was one. And then later was one. So these are ones I had asked Instagram to be like, hey, give me a list of 12 books and I will read them throughout the year. So I already knocked out two at this point. So later follows like this kid. It's a thriller sci-fi-ish kind of novel where this kid can 
in a way, talk to dead people, but only to a certain point. He can only talk to them like an hour or so after they have died, and he can only see them, um, and like they can't touch him or anything like that. So he's kind of used by his mom's like ex-girlfriend who's like a cop or detective, and he kind of like grows up like this. They first find out about it when he's like five or six, when his neighbor's wife passed away, and like he was able to talk to the wife and find out where something was missing that the husband wanted of hers to like remind her, remind him of her. So that was like the first inkling that the mom knew that something was kind of different about her son. And then the detective uses him to solve like this case where it was like a brutal murder. There was like secrets and stuff about like this treasure or like hidden monies and things. So it was interesting. It was pretty quick. Also an audiobook. Not my usual type of read, honestly, but I liked that I was pushed. I think this is my first Stephen King. So that's kind of cool too. So I'll take that. I gave it overall a three out of five stars. Not, I I think it was just average. I think there are other books that Stephen King may be known more for, but this one was kind of a nice introduction in case I want to continue into his world. Then I read We Have Always Been Here by Samra Habib, and this is a memoir where Samra kind of details her life from Pakistan to Canada to New York City, and I thought it was amazing. I thought it was a really profound take on like immigration on like struggles in the middle east and racism like just being treated differently and she's like an activist as it comes to pakistan kind of issues or like having that culture be accepted in like north america as well as LGBT lgbtqia plus issues because she identifies as queer and she starts exploring and figuring out what that means for her some of my favorite quotes i wrote down were we've always been here it's just that the world isn't ready for us yet I thought that was pretty cool. And then not everyone is equipped for activism in the traditional sense, marching, writing letters to officials, but dedicating your life to understanding yourself can be its own form of protest, especially when the world tells you that you don't exist. So that has come tr like come into my mind a lot lately as, and I'll talk about this during another book that I've read this month, this past month, when it comes to having conversations with folks or like larger groups and like debriefing about like an identity or just something challenging when it comes to like social issues. A lot of folks may not be at that space where they are like speaking out and like advocating like full on and using their voice in that kind of way, but more so learning more about that culture by reading, by listening, by, I don't know, like involving themselves with issues in a way that's not like loud and um, like marching in the streets kind of way. So that I appreciated them making that statement or Samra making that statement in here because it is tough, like especially nowadays when folks are more inclined to share their thoughts and opinions for what is right and getting justice and equality, but some folks aren't at that level yet, but what can they still do to to be activists in their own kind of way for things that they believe in, for the people that they love? So that I thought was really important and something that she stands on a lot. Like she gave a lot of speeches and lectures and interviews and um, talked about them, that experience with like inspiring young people and then coming up to her at the end and thanking her for sharing her story. So that I thought was beautiful. I gave that overall a four and a half out of five stars. Then I listened to Clan Lands by Sam Hewen and Graham McTavish. So these are the Outlander stars that are Jamie Fraser and Dougal McKenzie, if you're familiar with the show. If not, I think it's, I think if you were to read it, I listened to the audiobook because I had to listen to their voices. I like, that's the only experience I wanted was to hear them read it. And like the way that they read it was jovial and friendly and like they were having a conversation with each other, which I thought was really cool and a great way to tell a story. I, I did feel like I didn't gain too much additional information. If you've watched their show Men in Kilts on Stars, I feel like you could pro probably maybe gain a little bit more. I think they talked a little bit more in this story about how they came to be in the show and like kind of their backgrounds and ancestry, which I thought was awesome. And then they gave like insights into filming 
and different scenes that they did together. So in terms of like Scotland, I didn't feel like I learned anything new. It was cool like to hear about because I can't wait to go. I'm going hopefully in August if plans still stay in place that we can travel and get tested and all this kind of stuff with uh, COVID still in existence. But I thought it was enjoyable just to listen to them, listen to their friendship and their like camaraderie, their, their banter was fun. So overall I think I gave it like a three and a half out of five. Yeah, three and a half, not bad. I just, it didn't have like a lot of meat to it that I, I guess, because I already knew a lot of that information. Then I read Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. And oh my gosh, this might be my new favorite from him. I'm not sure. I'm staring at my other two books from him. Bear Town and Brit Marie was here. I don't have a man called Ova, oddly enough. I might have given that away. I don't remember. But this is amazing. It is about a kidnap or a hostage takeover kind of thing after a failed bank robbery and this bank robber or attempted bank robber was trying to rob a cashless bank and didn't know it and ends up at this apartment condo um open house kind of thing with these like five or six other people that like are just wild <laughs> it's it's funny it's emotional i just love frederick bachman's sense of humor like it is astonishing and whoever translate this i feel bad that i don't know who translated this oh, neil smith so the way that neil is able to translate this that it's still like enjoyable in english and like i'm laughing at a lot of like hilarious parts and like like shaking my head and it's just so cool to be attached to these characters like this even though in the beginning you're like what the heck is going on this is wild like this cannot be any more of a botched situation and it's just amazing a, lo a lot of hard topics in here too I would check out the trigger warnings in advance uh, specifically for suicide depression mental health but yeah it's freaking amazing loved it i don't know if i'll watch the adaptation i wasn't in love with the trailer when i saw it but who knows i might give it a chance but i don't think that'll sway me with how i feel about the book since the book is supreme <laughs> in my mind but yes five out of five stars epic amazing then i listened to white smoke by tiffany d jackson and this was wowzers another like it let it reminded me somewhat of ace of spades and not at the same time. It was still like thriller YA with predominantly black characters living in a town where like they may not feel belong or like they belong there and they, it's interesting because they move there because um, the main character's mom got like a fellowship or something to to start in this town which they're trying to like reinvent this town again they're the first family moved back into this neighborhood that looks like it was burned down and then they start it's a blended family so it's her and her son or her daughter and son and then she's married to a white man and then he has a daughter so blended family but they they don't always get along at least the kids where the the youngest daughter on the father's side lost her grandmother who was her best friend and she starts what appears to be talking to somebody in the home that they moved into. We learned that the home is haunted, that everybody in town knows this, and they're like, why the heck are, did you move in there? And a lot of strange things start happening in the nighttime, and then even sometimes in the daytime. But it just turns out to be so wild, the whole story, the, the secrets of that house, of that community. Um, yeah, it was, oh, wow. <laughs> I'd say Ace of Spades kept me on my the edge of the seat a little bit more than White Smoke, but White Smoke was still creepy, like from the beginning, like right in the first chapter or two, you're spooked, which was pretty cool. I didn't have any trouble sleeping or anything like that, but yeah, definitely spooky. And that one I gave a four out of five. Then I read Paris by the Book by Liam Callanan, and this was interesting. I think it had a lot of potential. It reminded me of the last thing he told me in terms of like a husband disappearing, like what do you do next? But this was different because there wasn't like some, in a way there wasn't some secret note left behind in a pile of money, but in a way there kind of was, but not, I don't know, it was similar, but not. So this family, it's now the mom and I think her two daughters, they up and moved to Paris because like she'd always dreamed of going to Paris. They never had enough money as a family. They went to like Paris in the United States, like Paris, 
Wisconsin, Paris, um, Illinois. Like there's, there's places like that. I know there's a London, Ohio. So trying to um, be cute and like fun and one day dream about going there. So they end up going there like just for a trip to uh, forget what's going on back home with like the, the mystery of their father slash husband being missing. And then they end up staying in Paris, owning a bookshop and like learning French, learning the culture until pieces of him start showing up. And they're trying to figure out like what's going on. Is he alive? Is he dead? What are these clues he's leaving behind? Should we leave all of this behind and go back to our life or try to start anew? So in that way, I think, I don't know. I liked the elements of Paris and France being around that I thought was pretty cool. But then it just kind of lost me with like, I just wasn't a fan of why the husband disappeared or like the rationale, the reason behind it. That I thought was like, really? That was why? And I guess I just got mad <laughs> at that. I think, yeah, the plot seemed kind of unrealistic, but I, I still enjoyed like the mystery of her trying to figure out what happened to him and also like the daughters and how they coped with grief and trying to figure out what happened to their father I thought was interesting. I think kids and like young people respond differently and they might not tell you right away but they are telling you in like the nuances or their their actions their words their their I don't know like how they hold themselves so that I thought was really well done but yeah overall three out of five stars then I read The Marriage of Opposites by Alice Hoffman. This is my last print book of the month. This I had no idea was kind of loosely based on a true story and it's historical fiction. So this follows the story of Rachel who is in um, the island of St. Domingue and is part of a Jewish family that I had no idea that there was like a huge Jewish community in like the islands in the, the Caribbean or like Latin America area. So we follow her as she like kind of does her duty and marries to join like these two families together in business and she's really young. She's like 16, 17 years old, becomes a mom because the, the man she marries is a widower and a lot older than her. And then they end up having kids and all of that. But like all of the people in her life, it just like intermingles in all these different stories that are interconnected and weaved, which I thought was great. And then we find out her son later on because her for, first her husband dies. She marries the husband's nephew, which causes a huge scandal in the community because like that's, you're not allowed to marry family even though they're not blood related it was still like a big thing and they were kind of shunned from their community and like had to like make do for like many many years until one of her sons from this other husband um kind of explores and like tries to build that community back up again or like have them be accepted and he later on becomes P the painter pizarro which i'm like had no idea that that was what this is about um, so yeah, it's a, there's a lot about family, a lot about duty, uh, promises, secrets, trust, infidelity again, lost children, reconnecting with lost loved ones and siblings and children and all of that. So there's a lot here. I like, as I was going through it, I was like, this is just brilliant. And I, this is Alice Hoffman's like earlier work. I read Practical Magic, which I think was a little bit later than this, like that whole series of magic. But this I thought was amazing and something I would love to see as an adaptation if possible. So five, I think four and a half, no, four and a half out of five. Four and a half out of five stars for me. Then the last book I read or listened to was Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. And this was also phenomenal. This goes back to what I was saying about being an activist and speaking up for different identities or like minority identities, specifically here in the United States. And this follows a young woman, Lily, who's a Chinese American living in, I think it's San Francisco in like the the mid 1950s. So not a great time in general for Chinese Americans or Asian Americans, but also for queer people, but also a combination of queer Chinese American, like not great at all. So she finds herself at this place called the Telegraph Club, which is a big queer club in that community and it ends up meeting this other girl or like is trying to like find herself because at first she finds this book in like a, like a, a 10 cent store or whatever and it's all it has it's about like two women who are in love but the ending she finds out is 
not um, like happy, like they end up being forced into like a mental institute or like forcing to be married to a man. So it was like this whole thing, but she is like discovering herself, like her friend is not supportive of, at all of like queer people. Their fan, like her family is like, oh, like, what are you doing with this person? Didn't you know they were outed or like they sent them away and blah, blah, blah. So it's interesting to see like this idea of chosen family, of assumptions that you were in a phase by your bi biological family potentially, or people you thought were your friends especially as like a young person that's, that must be very hard so yeah it she goes through a lot and has quite a journey with figuring out who she is why or how she can be true to herself and be true to her family and not be wrapped up in these lies that could just come back to haunt her and her family years down the line so she's being honest and saying who she is and who she knows she is and seeing what that reaction um, elicits from her family. So yeah, like I thought it was very powerful, very important message to share with young people or people in general wanting to know what that coming ex out experience is like or how to support people going through that experience. And yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. I gave that a four out of five stars. So yes, that is my wrap up. This went a lot longer, it's 30 minutes. Oh my gosh, I'm like, this has to be quick. I have to go um, watch a, I don't have to, I'm going to watch a symphony orchestra live stream. Cincinnati does that every once in a while. It was supposed to be last night, but we've been snowed in and iced in and they moved it to this afternoon for a live stream event. So I gotta go make my cheese platter <laughs> and pour a glass of wine at two o'clock in the afternoon. Oops. Yes, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. This was a lot longer of a wrap up, even though I kept saying like, oh, 10 books isn't a lot, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure a lot of people are like, what the heck, 10 books is plenty. So yes, we're in the midst of February, going to be doing my uh, or I'm still doing my romance reading vlog right now. That'll be live next Monday, which is Valentine's Day. Woo! -hoo! And I think, yeah, I think I have plans or what I know I'm going to do that day with my boyfriend. The weekend, like, leading up to that, we're going to, or not just us, we're having a game night with a few of my friends and then hosting Super Bowl Sunday where the Bengals will be playing. Woo! -hoo! So that'll be exciting. Already planning my menu for that. I love hosting like events, especially for the Super Bowl. It just makes me so happy to like make food and enjoy like the sense of like team and camaraderie, camaraderie and like cheering and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that is the plan for the rest of this week slash weekend. And then I'll have my book blogging retreat retreat at like a local coffee shop. And then I'll have my March TBR video, which I've already filmed. I was too excited and did a lot with my TBR jar. So yay. Anyway, thanks again. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up or comment down below. Feel free to hit the subscribe button or the notification bell to know when I post next. And yeah, just keep warm out there and have a great day and happy reading. Mm -hmm.